So people have been trying to do this, this sort of experiment for like a decade or more, but maybe two decades. Mm -hmm. There had been a group of people that had thought about doing this technique and then had ruled it out, said it's impossible, it won't work. And so the whole field stopped thinking about doing it. But we were new to the field. We hadn't heard the... We hadn't the been part of the discussion, discussion, so we were sort of outsiders. We didn't know it was impossible. It's basically, <laughs> I, I met you in the hall and we yeah. started talking and we were like, oh, no, we might be able to do this. Right. And a month later, we had the data. And then we showed this result. They were like completely blown away. It's called the Heisenberg microscope. If you imagine if you have a little particle and you wanted to look at it, you could know its position perfectly well at one instant in time, but then you wouldn't know where its position was after that, right? So even light that you used to observe it would still disturb it. It would transfer momentum to the object and kick it. And now all of a sudden you've given it an infinite uncertainty in terms of its velocity. To predict where it is after that, you'd have infinite uncertainty in terms of its position. What makes quantum mechanics sort of fascinating, and so this idea that an object can't both have its position well-defined and its momentum well-defined is, at the same time, is fundamentally just a property of waves, just a mathematical property of wave equations. So imagine a water wave. If I wanted to have a localized little sample volume of water, and then I asked, what does it do after? Well, it's going to disperse very quickly. Whereas if I have a sinusoidally traveling water wave, it's going to be dispersed over a huge range of space, but it has a very well-defined momentum. And that has nothing to do with, that's just classical physics, just the physics of waves. We're trying to understand these wave properties of things, you know, the wave property of you and I. We don't disperse, electrons don't just fall apart, protons just fall apart. It's natural to think of them as point particles or little objects. It's not natural to think of them as waves. But that's what part of what quantum mechanics is doing. The whole point is that people are now exploring bigger quantum objects that are much larger, you know, billions of atoms in it, uh, in our case. And the question would be, does it still behave quantum mechanically? Can I describe that with a wave function? Our experiments are actually very easy to understand. If you've seen any of the old spy movies, you'll know what I'm talking about. So usually there's some conversation happening and they want to know what the people are talking about and they use some sort of a device to listen to the vibrations of the window. And they send a little laser. The laser bounces off and then they have a detector that looks at how the light changes. And the photo that are being reflected, they end up having a phase or frequency change just because of the Doppler effect. So if the mirror is moving towards the light while it's being reflected, it actually shifts the frequency of the light up. It causes a, a blue shift, and if it's moving away, it causes a red shift in the light. And this is basically our measurement system. We have a laser that shoots light at a structure, and we listen to it. And so if there's no one talking here, well, what's the motion going to be? From here, we do a few things. We use liquid helium to go to about 4 Kelvin. After all this cooling, we manage to basically get the system to a temperature that's zero. Okay, and this is what's called an optical cavity or a resonant cavity. Your light actually becomes this viscous fluid in between. It completely damps the motion. All right, we suck thermal energy out of the system until it gets really cold. So classically, if this thing had no thermal energy, the, the thing just sits there, and it's just at one position, and that's the end of the story, right? If I take my laser light and I bounce it off of it, uh, this thing should look like it's not moving at all. Quantum mechanically, though, if you solve the wave, wave equation, quantum mechanics tells you, well, hold on, there's a probability for where the position of that thing is. This zero temperature state is actually banned by quantum mechanics. It's disallowed. In quantum mechanics, what happens when there's no excitations, you get to what's called the ground state, which is a solution for Schrodinger's equation. So this mirror, when it's completely cold, when it's not moving anymore, it should still be vibrating by a, a distance that's about one femtometer. And just this, this motion that we're trying to study is 100,000 times smaller than the radius of an atom. The way we decided to check whether we can see this motion or not was using the property, this very counterintuitive property of the ground state functions. Even though it has energy, it can't possibly have any lower energy. It's got to have some finite energy associated with that jiggling around. It's uncertain in its position. Now if I bounce light off of it, there's going to be a Doppler shifted, like a red shifted and a blue shifted component to the light that gets back. But the question is, blue shifted light, the photon has a higher frequency, so it has a higher energy. And red shifted, it has a lower frequency, so it has a lower energy. That energy had to come from somewhere. So where did the energy come from? Well, it came from the motion. The motion is what pushes the photon back a little harder. Now if your mirror is in its ground state, then when you bounce light off of it, there can't possibly be any blue shifted light. That last little bit of energy, you can't get rid of it. You should be able to sense this energy, but you still can't extract any energy from it. We did this measurement, and you know, we looked at the red and the, and the blue sidebands, and we cooled this object down. And as we cooled it, we were looking to see what would happen. So you know, if it's classical, they're both going to shrink together all the way down to zero, and we'll be left with no blue and red Doppler shifted sidebands. If it's a quantum object, we expect them to cool down, get really small, but eventually the blue to go away, and there'll still be some small amount of red. 
And so we did the experiment and what we found, sure enough, once it got cold enough, we saw that the blue basically went away faster than the red and we were left with just a large asymmetry between these two sidebands, which is an indication that for these, even these macroscopic objects, that quantum mechanics rules the day and the classical physics is actually, you know, not an appropriate description, that it's fundamentally a quantum object. That's when you really start to realize it's not just atoms we're talking about here, it's mechanical motion, it's mechanical objects that actually, you know, can be described by, by a, a quantum mechanical wave function. Once you believe you can describe it with a quantum mechanical wave function, that also means that it has other quantum properties. And those other quantum properties are completely bizarre compared to our everyday experience. And we can talk about that later, but that's where it starts to become really interesting.